Hi, everybody. So welcome to um, the Azure Spring Clean March 2023. Uh, my name is Abdul Kazi, and I have uh, Chris Gill, my partner in crime. Hey, Chris, how you doing? Great, thank you. How are you? Good, good. Hey, good. thanks for uh, um, recording this session with me. We're going to be talking about cost management. So um, I know cost management is really a topic top of mind for everybody, especially post COVID now, everybody, you know, jumped on the cloud and they're not trying to figure out, okay, how do we manage our cost? Because as everybody knows, cost is really um, uh, consumption based in um, the cloud. So before we jump into the actual discussion, let's do a quick round of introductions. So as I mentioned, um, I'm Abdul Kazi. I've been working in the IT industry for almost 20 years now, working with Azure since 2014. Uh, very much involved in the community as well. Co-founder uh, of Cloud Come With Us with obviously Chris. And uh, we're always looking for new speakers. So if you wanna come and speak, you know, come join us. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Give us a call type, you know, you know where to find us, but yeah, we'd love to have you. Thanks, Abdul. So, hi, I'm Chris Gill, I'm located in Rochester, New York. Um, you know, I, I am traditionally a guy that just likes to learn a bunch of stuff. So um, really just kind of go and break things, a lot of things, break a lot of eggs, make a lot of omelets. But, um, you know, been in the IT industry for about 20 years. Um, come cloud with us, you know, as we talked, uh, it's been around about a year now. So we've had a lot of fun with that. But you know, we're here to bring some fun in cost management, uh, Azure Spring Clean, and, you know, hopefully help you all just kind of, you know, keep a a uh, thumb on the pulse of, you know, how things are going in your organizations or the environments you manage. Um, and just keep costs low. Um, you know, as Microsoft says, um, do more with less. So that's that's kind of why we're here today, trying to help you do that. So, so let's kick it off. So yeah, with cost analysis, uh, <clears throat> you know, everybody's trying to figure out what their monthly cost is and that's how you would be control, controlling the cost. So Chris, what have you seen from a cost analysis aspect in your organization or others that uh, you've talked to? Yeah, so <clears throat> from, from cost analysis perspective for us, um, again, you know, I'd love to say that we were using a ton of services out there, but the services that we are using, um, we typically have to kind of break them down, um, at least for our environment, by, you know, what's used by maybe an IT group, financial group, um, and then further kind of breaking them down for tax purposes based on you know, how they're measured or used across our um, estate. So, you know, if there's folks that are in, Maybe San Francisco versus, um, you know, Chicago versus New York, where I'm located. Um, there's different tax uh, um, incurred for these things. So typically I'm, I'm being asked um, based on invoices, like how to break that down and how to give some insights. So um, there's some tricks of the trade there. Um, you know, there's there's some also, uh, also some struggles with that too. But, um, you know, from that perspective, that's usually what I'm asked for month over month. Um, how about you, Abdul? Yeah, that's actually an interesting point you raised. For me, you know, being in Canada, um, we deal in the Canadian currency. Although sometimes the cost management might tool might show you USD, or obviously there's other currency that you can look into. But um, that's one of the challenges too, right? The currency conversions, uh, looking at the cost, tracking it month to month, and the spend. Sometimes people um don't realize that that the cost is going to go up if you do not turn off services i've had incident actually from my personal uh, experience i was working or doing a te doing some testing with uh, windows uh, virtual desktop uh, <laughs> and then i left the vm on uh when we got the bill it was like racked up like 800 dollars or something oh, so <laughs> Wow. Uh, good thing it was protesting and the company is like, yeah, you know, 
they covered it for me. I didn't have to pay out of pocket, but that was really a gotcha moment for me, making sure, you know, if you're not using resources, you should turn them on. And then that's why you need to set up budgeting and whatnot, which, which we'll talk about in, in in the next few slides. Great. And it's interesting you say that too. And one of the things I would definitely say, you know, from a perspective of, um, <clears throat> you said virtual desktop, I find a lot of folks that are using backup services too. And, um, you know, if they're using recovery vaults or uh, recovery services vault or something like that, where disks are, you know, engaged for some test or whatever else, they tend to just get left behind. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about that and touch on, you know, how some of these tools can kind of find those for you and help clean up. All right. So as, as we mentioned, um, you know, a lot of these, uh, you know, Microsoft cost management from perspective of, you know, just giving you insight um, on, you know, detail, uh, different types of services you're using in your environment, resources, um, you know, drilling down pretty deep into details on, you know, subscription, enrollment, even a management group um, basis, uh, just to kind of help you manage your environments. Um, again, month over month, but there's different date ranges that you can apply to these, uh, apply to your cost analysis. Um, anything else you'd like to add, Abdul? No, I think that pretty much sums it up, right? Um, the only thing I would say is depending on what um, Azure subscription you have, sometimes things vary on that piece. So as you might be aware, you know, you can buy Azure subscription through enterprise agreement, through pay as you go. If you even have a personal MSDN account, you mm -hmm. can do do that. If you're a Microsoft partner, you get uh, credits, um, you know, depending on the gold and silver competency and whatnot. So um, some of those subscriptions might not have the capability of Azure or Microsoft uh, cost management. So just be aware, aware of that piece. Great point. Great. You know, we jumped a little ahead, but just talking about, you know, some of the views that we have available to us. Um, again, all customizable, uh, but a lot of the stuff that I'm finding, like out of the boxes, is, is pretty good. Um, it, you know, it'll break it down by service, uh, by resource group, by location, uh, just kind of giving, you know, again, details further down into your invoice. Um, you know, again, as I mentioned initially, uh, you know, kind of breaking that down for our organization, I kind of need to figure out like what part of the United States we might be using services in or, or whatnot uh, based on different tax brackets. So this kind of helps achieve that. Yeah, and the other thing I want to also mention is, uh, you know, if you are doing, a lot of companies are going to be doing chargebacks to the internal department. So let's say if you're an enterprise customer, large enterprise customer, and you are going to be doing large, um, you know, chargebacks. So you might just produce an invoice, as you can see, and these are, the invoice could be based on um, a specific resource group or resources, or depending how you, define your subscription right so it could be under the management group you pretty much have to say okay this management group belongs to a line of business application all the uh cost is going to be going to the charge to that department so you can absolutely do that as well awesome and then as we talk about reconciling you can also dig a little bit into um, forecast it's been right so you know as we were talking about well this is um, what we've been charged for the past month or year whatever else and we can also look forward uh, kind of get some ideas based on you know what ha what has our usage been month over month year over year over the past you know periods and then get an idea of you know is this on budget is this on par um, do we need to go you know hit up the bank a little bit for, for services um, based on growth, based on maybe merger and acquisition, maybe, you know, um, just like a uh, standard usage or maybe fluctuation in usage. So. Yeah, no, that's a fair point. And the other thing is um, you could always monitor to make sure, you know, if you're coming back to this, 
the forecast piece, it's going to tell you, are you going to break the bank or not? Right. So that's going to be the huge piece from a budget standpoint. The other one thing I would mention, though, one thing that forecast sometimes does not give you is uh, the bandwidth cost. You know, as you might be aware, uh, going in or it comes any data going into Azure is free, but anything coming out of uh, Azure is going to be cost. So that might that cost might not be very accurate because that is dependent on how much data is coming out. So let's say if you're hosting a web application, it's going to be dependent on the traffic. One day you might have a huge amount of traffic. The other day you might not, right? So sometimes that forecasting is challenging, but on the other hand, if you're running a... Um, let's say a virtual machine or even <clears throat> SQL Server or whatnot, those mm -hmm. costs are uh, predicting those costs is going to be fairly easy. Yeah. That's right. And I always, uh, when you say that, it always comes into my mind of, uh, you know, the we talk about Black Friday, right? It's so <laughs> typical, like right before Christmas, it's like people have, um, I don't want to say people, organizations have spikes, right? It could be Amazon, it could be Walmart, it could be Target, any of these big businesses. Um, could be small businesses too, but there's a spike. Um, there will be a spike of traffic of folks coming, wanting to you know, purchase, get a service. Um, and, you know, that's something that you kind of just have to plan for. And But you're right, that egress traffic, um, you know, is, is an interesting one for sure. Um, kind of hard to predict, but exactly. But but at least you know that's not a anomaly, right? So that's not going to happen uh, a lot. The other thing I would also mention that came to my mind is I was working with um, a partner of Microsoft, and um, they got a bill after a month, and the bill was like really out of back, really high. What they figured out was their account was compromised. Uh, and there was somebody else was using um, their services and whatnot, right? So, uh, or somebody accidentally turned on some service. So, it, forecasting can help you, but it's not going to give you real uh, time uh, alerts and whatnot. So, you kind of have to set up your budgets. You have to kind of look at uh, regularly what's showing up on the dashboard as well. Right. All right. And interestingly enough, you talked about cost management dashboard. How convenient. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right, exactly, right? Yeah, so uh, uh, the, the good thing about the dashboards is you can actually dis, uh, have your own view and you customize the dashboards based on what the needs are. So you might say, oh, I have a line of business application that we have to do a chargeback. I'm going to create a dashboard on that. I'm going to do a dashboard for the entire organization because I want to ha have a number. I want to have a dashboard just on maybe uh, a project we're doing. It's mm -hmm. a small six months project. Uh, we have to charge the customer so we, uh, and create a dashboard on that, right? So it's very flexible from that aspect because you can have multiple dashboards. And the good thing is uh, that you can provide access to those dashboards to individuals. So for the project, if you create a dashboard, you can just assign the permission to that dashboard and be done with it rather than uh, that person would have the access to the higher dashboard and they're looking at the cost from the entire company aspect. Right. And as you mentioned here, you know, we have an example of, you know, how to kind of break that down maybe based on a project. So the first dashboard kind of showing that overall, you know, here's the entire organization or enterprise. Um, here would be just focused on one project or maybe one part of the business. So um, nice that these are, you know, easily customizable. Um, you can share them. You can basically download, share with another, you know, person that's helping you manage this um, or maybe a billing administrator in your organization too. All right. This is always a fun one. This is reservations and budgeting. You know, it's, <clears throat> I struggle with this for sure. It's like, uh, what do I, what do I think we're going to use? And you know, uh, part of that comes into budgeting, but it also was a, plays a big impact in the reservations as well, right? Because if we can kind of guesstimate based on, and I, I think a lot of this is dependent on historical data. If you have good historical data out here, you can kind of predict 
and say, no, I want to go out and reserve um, instances or services or whatever else and potentially save some money by doing that. Um, but you got to have good historical data first to kind of go on, right? Yeah, no, that's a fair point. So, for example, if you're running um, a virtual machine, right, as infrastructure as a service, and you know it's a custom app, um, you won't be able to move that into, um, or you won't be able to modernize that either doing or through past platform as service or even, you know, microservices like Dockers or Kubernetes, then reser reservations makes absolutely sense. Um, the other one, good use case we've seen for reservation is uh, virtual, virtual desktops because a lot of people, what they're doing now, they're like, you know, rather than uh, doing, <clears throat> Uh, creating a pool of virtual desktops, and that actually is much easier because they're sharing am among different people, uh, and then th it's a fixed cost. The cost is mm -hmm. not going to go up. People say, hey, I'm only using this, for, although 8 to 5, but we know we don't really work 8 to 5 now. People want to work anytime, you know, checking emails whatnot. So <clears throat> If you shut those VMs down, then you'll have to bring them up. So people like, you know, rather than going the route of shut down after 5, 6, 7 p.m., whatever, uh, just do the reserve. You know it's a fixed cost. You don't have to worry about shutting them down. And it's available anytime people want to jump on. I like that. I like that. It also reduces over the admin overhead, too, from that perspective. So good point. Sure. All right, <clears throat> so um, quite an interesting thing. There's, you know, a lot of the stuff as we talk about historical, like how do I keep that historical information? Uh, maybe reports for a certain amount of time. Um, let's be honest, a lot of financial organizations need, you know, up to seven years of data for, for a lot of these things, uh, depending on what type of project or service you're providing. So um, this export, approach allows you to do just that, um, you know, from a perspective of scheduling data, um, basically data in, uh, in, in the form of reporting data that is uh, back out to maybe storage account for uh, review, you know, over a course of time. This is a really nice feature. Um, it's just, you know, it's like, a, I don't want to say it's a set it and forget it. I mean, Let's be honest, we need to go and review these things uh, every so often. But, you know, it's it's a nice, hey, I set this up. Um, you know, we can kind of go back and double check and just make sure every once in a while that it's doing what we expect it to do. Um, but again, fully integrated in the cost analysis. We, we kind of, you know, honestly, anyone who's who's got that, you know, resource-based access control or RMAC role to, to kind of set some of the stuff up um, can just go out and, Say, you know, based on a subscription, based on resource, whatever else, um, schedule that, get it going and, you know, save it somewhere safe in the storage account that we can back up and keep around for a little while um, for extended retention purposes. Yeah, no, exactly. And also just to mention that, you know, from a FinOp aspect, right? Um, FinOps financial operations is become, which is the new buzzword now, everybody's moving in that direction because of the okay. cost. Um, some companies have a uh, <clears throat> dedicated FinOps team. So for them to get this notification or email on a daily, monthly basis would be ideal because then they don't have to go back to the cloud operations team. Hey, can you run me a report? Uh, and what happened to the report? I didn't receive the uh, email. So uh, exporting data, it's an automated process. You t you're taking away the human error, plus it automates you so people whoever needs the information gets the information. So um, FinOps might be billing back or charge doing a chargeback internally to the other department. Or if you're an ISV or, you know, you're a Microsoft partner or whatnot, you might have to char uh, charge your external customers. This is going to help you as well. Mm -hmm. Good point. All right. <clears throat> Now, I'll be honest, Abdul, I might need some help with this one because I, you know, <laughs> I, I think we all, you know, there's a lot of talk about multi-cloud and, you know, TCP, AWS and whatever, um, you know, Azure all fit in there. But honestly, um, you know, it, it's nice to see that there's this toe in to say, well, it's not just 
um, what you're using here, but you can integrate with other third-party cloud providers as well and get a little bit of a holistic view of your cloud spend across the board. So um, if you don't mind, kind of talk about this one for us, please. Yeah, no, absolutely. So first thing is a lot of companies are going multi-cloud now, right? That's a reality. Bef a couple of years ago, you would ask, oh, I want to stick with Azure or AWS or GCP. Mm -hmm. uh, the thing is, all cloud companies have really created a niche, if you will. You know, generally speaking, when we talk about GCP, their AI, or they have their very specific niche that of workloads that you want to use. Uh, if you're a Microsoft shop, you'll be like, yeah, I want to use Azure because I can bring my on-prem licensing into Azure, which is going to save me quite a bit of cost. If you're coming from mm -hmm. the development work, generally speaking, you would be on the AWS side. So what Microsoft is really trying to do here is bring, give you a single pane of glass where you can take a look at your cost and you don't have to log into multiple portals or so the Azure portal for Azure cost and then AWS portal to the uh, AWS cost, right? Mm -hmm. Although if you're a large enterprise, you would be using third-party tools like Cloud Checker or others to manage, which is fine. But if you're a small mid-market, you know, and you're like, yeah, I don't want to really invest um, in the tool because investing is one thing. The cost of that third-party tool is fine, but then also the challenge is um learning that tool as well right because um yeah. any new tool takes time to learn and keep up with it so that's actually perfect for microsoft aspect that you can take a look at your aws cost and then if you need to really drill down you can always go into aws turn off the services and do whatnot so i think this is um, a, a good decision for microsoft to move in the right direction yeah and i, I like what you said there too i'm gonna... I'm just going to point out one thing that um, I like the the unified approach here where, you know, it's like I think a lot of us as IT folks and I, I realize it's like, oh, yeah, I'm comfortable. I can get into the portal and just click around and hop around. But a lot of the folks that are, you know, maybe our billing administrators are on the FinOps side um, they just want to get in, get the information they need and, and get back to, you know, doing whatever else they need to do to to keep us moving along. So. Um, the more that we can do to unify that experience and not confuse folks, um, the better <laughs> off we are. So honestly, right? I mean, it's, a, you know, if we have three different cloud providers, it's like why, um, why, you know, force folks to kind of go out and dig for that information. If they can get it from one spot, giddy up. So, yeah. And one of the other challenges is all the three clouds um, charge cost differently mm -hmm. um you know so sometimes Good that's point. also a little bit learning curve as well because you might see a cost in azure and in aws and you might say hey, i'm going to compare because but sometimes it's not comparable right 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 all right um so one of the other extensions um and just to point out i know we have pbi here but power bi so um, one of the other extensions as well is if we wanted to, whether you know in the cloud or even on premises, uh, folks that are experienced with building Power BI dashboards um, and reports, um, this connector <clears throat> and the quick template apps available um, to kind of connect into uh, Microsoft Cost Management, pull down information, um, and you know kind of allow you to work with pivots and slicers and all this other good stuff, uh, you know, all the richness inside of Power BI um, available at your fingertips. So especially so if you, you know, as I said, look at this demo version here, um, maybe want to change the colors, make things a little more inclusive for folks that are, you know, reading these reports, um, you've got that opportunity at your hands now. So. Yeah, and Power BI is an amazing tool. It, it, it does wonders because obviously from a dashboard standpoint, there are going to be limitations that uh, Power BI should be able to give answers to. So yeah, uh, and keep in mind, you do have to buy li Power BI license. So there's going to be additional cost to it, but you know, given the cost, there is going to be additional feature compatible uh, components that you will be getting out of it. All right. All right. 
So now um, let's talk about the accountability. And I think we, we did touch on this a little bit. I know we maybe jumped ahead a little bit, but, um, you know, again, it's just, <clears throat> you know, kind of kind of hitting back to it, when I look at and it, I guess when I look at this slide, I think a little bit of our, um, you know, shared management perspective from any cloud provider, right? Um, as you go and you start to use some of these services, um, there's some things that, you know, the cloud provider is responsible for, other things that, you know, we as the customer are responsible for. And, and that accountability rings true here as well for, you know, just keeping keeping things under order um, or in order from a management perspective for both the administrators, um, you know, through management groups, through tagging, um, assigning those resources to certain parts of the organization, um, but also, you know, understanding that there's a financial tag and cost to a bunch of this stuff, um, making sure that from an IT to financial to even business perspective that everyone's aligned. Um, they understand, you know, what the clear goal and budget may be from from that business, um, and then the the last one there is just that continuous improvement, right? making sure that it's like we don't set it and forget it. Uh, we kind of go out and take a look at things, um, you know, hopefully on a monthly basis. But I know that's not a reality for everyone. I would say at least you know quarterly basis to just you know check, make uh, you know keep the pulse. Um, check that things are in order that, as you mentioned, Abdul, that, you know, something just didn't get randomly stood up in your environment that you didn't know about. <laughs> um, so <laughs> anything you'd like to add there? Yeah. So <clears throat> one thing I want to kind of focus on is um, governance. So, so some of you might be aware, you know, Microsoft has the CAF cloud adoption framework uh, mm -hmm. and governance is one of the pieces there. Um and I actually talked about governance in my other talks. So if you're interested, take a look at that. But real quick on the governance side from accountability on the cost management is people, uh, you know, don't put enough governance. So you, first of all, you need to have a governance team when you're moving to the cloud, because as I said, cloud is consumption based. It's not your on-prem where you're doing capital expenditure. So you have to make sure you have a governance team, which uh, takes a look from a holistic approach saying, okay, you cannot spin up any service in Azure. As you know, Azure has a lot of like almost 300 services. So if you don't limit, people can go and start, you know, spinning up services. And then after a month, you'll get the bail in. <laughs> I kind of broke the bank there. So from a governance standpoint, you really need to have set controls. Plus uh, also from a governance standpoint, that's going to help you from a compliance standpoint as well, because uh, if you are not able, or if you are, if you should not provision any um, workloads because of compliance in a different region, that's going to help you as well. So, and that again comes down to accountability. The other thing is, you need to have a FinOps team, and the FinOps team and the governance team should really work on a RACI model, R A C I. So, mm -hmm. responsible, accountable, you know consulted and informed, they can only be one person who's responsible. Not everybody is going to be responsible, right? Obviously, you're going to inform every, everybody. You're going to consult a lot of people, uh, different sh stakeholders. But I see this challenge in a lot of organizations where nobody, no one person is responsible and sometimes mm -hmm. like this. <laughs> so uh, that is going to become a challenge right off the bat. Yeah. I, I couldn't agree more. And <clears throat> bonus points. Thank goodness we're not giving people a quiz at the end, but the, the RACI would definitely be a quiz-worthy moment. So, <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, um, you know, we talked a few times about management groups, but again, just, you know, ensuring that from a perspective of, I guess, organiz or organizing your environment, just making sure that the, um, you know, again, the, the resources that are being utilized by different groups and however you organize your business um, are, you know, kind of consolidated um, and tagged in some respect for, you know, for the groups using these resources, um, but also tagged 
appropriately so that we can get that information back as part of the cost management and budgeting. So, um, yeah, sure. We all know that, you know, each one of these uh, management groups can apply different policies, have different security um, applied to them. But, you know, from a perspe perspective of just identifying the sheer resources and, and who or what, um, I guess, org or group they're applied to is, is, very, very helpful and a really effective way of kind of managing um, your workloads in the cloud. Yeah, no, uh, that's a fair point. And one thing to add here is, Chris, on the um, tagging, um, I do not recommend enforcing Azure policy because that can break a lot of things, but I, I'll say people should be enforcing uh, Azure policy for tagging. So if anybody is provisioning any new resources and they do not have tagged that resource, you know, Azure policy is going to enforce and say you cannot uh, re uh, provision this because you, you haven't assigned a tag. And the reason being is, to your point, right, with tagging, we can go back and say, okay, we can do a chargeback. We can say, okay, if it's this is assigned to a project, this is assigned to a different line of business, that actually is going to help you in the long term. Right. You know, just just to give an example, like even my organization, you know, typically we talk about marketing and finance, HR, IT, but <clears throat> I think we all have that. Uh, you know, from a legal perspective, we have practice groups and teams and, you know, different structuring. So we get even a little more granular from that perspective, um, from just the standard org types to, you know, uh, broken down a little bit more for um, how legal does business too, so. All right, Armac. Um, Joel, if you don't mind, I know I've been kind of leading uh, the, the way with a bunch of these, but why don't you start and I'll follow up this time. <laughs> <laughs> sure, thanks, Chris. So uh, you might be <clears throat> aware about RBAC, right? Role-based access control. Um, I, with that, you can assign access, what people can access, what services, or uh, I guess, with RBAC, you can um, limit access to management groups, subscriptions, uh, resource groups, and resources as well. And one of the beauties of RBAC is you ha specifically have a role for cost management um, contributor and reader. So that's actually great. One of the things I want to point out, and it's my personal pet peeve, if do not assign owner or contributor role to uh, anybody i've seen this quite a bit so do not do that uh and use the custom roles i would say use the custom roles as much as possible although the the caveat there is you would need um azure premium ad premium p1 or p2 license mm -hmm. but <clears throat> that actually gives you a very good granularity right so j just think about uh, your on-prem environment you start with least privilege because you don't want to give access same thing with the cloud um, start with least privilege. Do not provide more access th than they need. So, you know, things are safer. Chris, I'll uh, let you add. Yeah, and I, I like the, I know where, I feel like I know where you're leading me. And I know this isn't a privilege identity management talk, but, you know, <laughs> I, I will take the opportunity to at least say from a conditional access policy perspective for those folks that are, you know, identity and access management uh, folks or, you know, just uh, Azure AD folks and listening, watching this, um, these might be roles that you want to consider putting, you know, conditional access policy behind too to say, I really don't want this information to be read, you know, outside of the walls of the organization or only on specific devices or you know, only certain times. So <clears throat> this might be an opportunity to do um, <clears throat> excuse me, a step up multi-factor to kind of get into some of these things too. Um, again, you know, knowing that this is, there's a little bit of sensitive information, especially if it's a, um, you know, if we are putting certain tags on things, um, you never know what type of naming convention folks are using, but if there's something sensitive business-wise, um, just want to make sure it's protected, so. Yeah, makes sense. And I would definitely hit home on the owner. Yeah, that's a that's a no. That's a non-starter. Try not to give owner um, because that will. It's not just for cost uh, management, but it's for the entire resource. So, kind of bad. That's a good tip. I like that one. 
And then I kind of already talked about this one in the previous slide, but you know, tagging for cost analysis. And, and you can see now why that kind of makes sense because then for finance, different applications, deployment, you know, even a project, you can even have a project tag. So, and you can do audits as well. A lot of companies, they say, okay, uh, we'd, we have this line of business application and then six months in, the costs have gone down. Let's do an edit on the tags. Or sometimes the cost might not match up because people might say, hey, we're getting this cost, but uh, the chargeback we're getting back is is not um, is missing. So you might be missing some tags. So uh, again, right, uh, enforce the tags. That is really important in my opinion. Chris, yeah. anything to add? Oh, I, I especially I'm gonna again just point out that you know you subtly snuck in the project one. I, I really like that one. And I use that in our org, and the reason being is, um, and I think we've all been there. So there's so many times where it's like, hey, we're gonna try something. We we think this is the direction we're gonna go with some project or some solution, and we get most of the way through it, and we're like, yeah, you know what? We're gonna either redo it or rebuild it or go a different direction. Um, not that it's a failed project. It's just, you know, we've decided that eh, it wasn't effective the route we were going. Um, it's a really nice way to just clean up and go out and say, find these tags, find these resources that have this project tag applied and, you know, issue some of the cleanup or deletion um, in your environment. Again, just saving you a ton of expense, you know, removing some of the expense, saving you some money. So. All right. Budgeting, 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 budgeting. Um, you know, it's like I we can't say it enough. I mean, a lot of this stuff is again, it's like you want to make sure that um, you're not going over budget. Things can get very quickly out of hand. I know I mentioned earlier, um, you know, even as I look through my some of my tenants, you know, we're, we're toying with, um, you know, maybe. Uh, you know, free resources or, or, you know, paid for resources um, for just learning for, you know, maybe writing blog articles or books or whatever, or doing, you know, recon or, you know, uh, research for our organizations. And um, I can tell you how many times I've gone into my own tenants and just looked at, you know, um, you know, resources that are kind of sitting out there um, and, haven't been cleaned up and you know again it's like you want to make sure that uh, you know from a budgeting perspective you're just really uh, you know properly forecasting that you're really taking a look at those um, resources cleaning up and making sure that you're staying on budget um, again it's those those things that are just kind of hanging out there um, can kind of get you um, off budget real quick so do yeah. any additional thoughts here? Yeah, and Microsoft actually does a great job on the budgeting because spe specifically on the notifications and maybe go uh, the next slide. So we'll probably see, um, you know, budgeting like this is allocation, a uh, cost allocation, but with budgeting, you can put a budget in there. So for our tenants, right, we have our MSDN and test tenant. What we usually do is we say, okay, I'm going to put a hundred dollar budget. Uh, <laughs> At 80%, give me a notification. So yep. we, we're not going over budget. So those kind of things you can do, um, you know, and then the cost is going to be allocated as well. Awesome. And then from a cost um, optimization standpoint, I, I think this is very important because, you know, if you're a developer, the developer really would be like, oh, give me the biggest VM you have. <laughs> but again, from this example, do you really need the biggest one? Or can you break it down into three smaller ones and whatnot, right? Um, it obviously gonna depend on the use case. So if you're doing virtual desktop, virtual desktop, you might um, have a big pool, uh, host pool, and you might need bigger VMs. But if it's um, uh, individual, a uh, person using the uh, uh, virtual desktop, then yeah, it might be a small one, right? And Chris, right. what are you seeing in your organization and what have you come across in your experience? Yeah, so <clears throat> again, from um, just, you know, managing, well, 
Uh, I'll put it this way. Yes, I think we all have the folks that are just give me the biggest thing that you have available and, <laughs> and let's go and, <laughs> because I want to get stuff done. Yeah, and, um, yeah, I, you know, from a perspective of, um, you know, our development team, they all, you know, for the most part are using, utilizing their 150 to $200 a month for, for MSTN. So it's a good way to kind of learn and, and toy and stand up um, things. Um, there's also the, you know, 365 developer environment too, which is, has been pretty awesome. Um, but from a, you know, from a different perspective of, you know, what do we have running in, um, in the organization or even other organizations that I talk to, um, folks typically have, um, basically, you know, policies that are set for certain VM sizes and things that, you know, people mm -hmm. can go and choose from. So think of it as a, a library of available resources. And depending on what environment you're in, it might be a, you know, hopefully folks have like a dev a QA test in a prod environment set up, but not everyone's graced with that. So, you know, it, again, can do the math. It's like uh, you go from, hey, we have this one tenant which has, you know, three different environments. Um, you know, it's a lot more to manage, but uh, it also done correctly kind of helps with that too. So. And I, I think that leads to us to the next slide. You kind of slide the Azure advisor <laughs> in there. So go yeah. ahead. Yeah. Go ahead and so talk about I, that I, as well. Yeah, I, I think we both can probably talk, you know, for hours on this tool. But um, what a great tool! I, and I think we have a few slides here on this. But Azure Advisor really, truly um, is—it's just a great insight for your environment. Um, you know, when so if you're in a tenant, if you haven't used this before, um, just go search at the top for Advisor. Um, it will kind of walk you through a bunch of the stuff. It gives you insights into. Not only cost, security, performance, I um, mean, you know, all the stuff that we have here on the screen, but very quickly we'll start telling you a story of here's some recommendations, here's some things that are in your environment that you might want to get rid of. Um, you know, we were joking, I think before we even started this recording, um, you know, I went out and took a look at one of my tenants. I actually had seven recommendations right off the top of the <laughs> bat. Um, it told me over the next year I'd save $240. Hey, it's not a whole heck of a lot, but to me, that's, that's a good chunk. Um, but it told me that, you know, I was learning and toying with, um, you know, backup services, recovery services, um, you know, um, just moving VMs from uh, kind of testing and standing them up, making sure that they were coming back out of, you know, recovery services vault. Um, the disks are just laying out there. They weren't attached to any VMs. And that was one of the recommendations. It said, you have seven disks. They're not attached to any VMs. They haven't been used in a couple months. So um, do you want to consider acting on these or do you want to ignore it for now um but again quick recommendations you know in these industry best practices a lot of rule-based stuff out here um not role-based but rule-based basically just going through and saying you know here's some projections on things that are used um again the you know the term here with deep linked um that all goes all the way back into our cost management microsoft cost management process but um really quick way to get some insights into where we can kind of just prune things and, you know, spring clean our environments. So, Joel, anything you'd like to add there? Yeah, so with Azure Advisor, it also, you know, kind of gives you a score as well. So Azure Advisor right, is a much bigger tool uh, because it, it does recommendations, not only on cost management, but also from security aspect as well. So when you tie cost management to security, that's gonna be a win-win for you. Mm -hmm. uh, so also, you know, um, the only thing I've seen is let the cost advisor run for some time and then you can optimize. Uh, and, and coming back to optimization, you know, the right slide is, it's going to tell you the VM right sizing. So, so what I see a lot of customers do, they do a lift and shift. So they're like, yeah, you know, we really don't want to uh, reuse the seven R's, refactor, rehost, um, you know, from a modernization standpoint. So they're doing resizing uh, the VMs. If the VMs are shut down, then you you basically just take them off, but this is going to give you a great um, insight of what should be done and how to, like how your environment should look like from a cost management. 
like it. I like it. I like it. And yeah, just in pointing out on the screen too, there's a you know postpone versus dismiss. Um, and I, I I tend to get tripped up on that too. But um, I know from a perspective of postpone, meaning I want to come back to this at some point. And you know, yes, I appreciate the recommendation. I want to come back to this and look at it again maybe next month or you know next period make sure that we're still on track maybe we you know resize uh, refactor rehost whatever that might be the dismiss is basically i don't want to see this recommendation again so be careful with those choices but um, <laughs> dismiss you know that'll just make it disappear so um you know I, we want to make sure that we're kind of coming back it's like just you know hold your feet to the fire postpone uh, where you can you can still go back and take a look at them after they've been dismissed but um you know, just to kind of clarify on those two options all right and then we're into reserved instance and recommendations there and again um you know as part of advisor a lot of this stuff bubbles up into um, some recommendations, you know, it's not only a recommendation of cleanup, but a recommendation on, hey, do we, you could probably save yourself a ton of money or a good chunk of money um, as potential savings. So depending on the resource, um, depending on the SKU or even location too, because again, don't forget, you know, resources could cost differently depending on where they're running, um, what part of the world they're running at. Um, a lot of those reserved instances, however, um, and maybe a dual, you can hit on this a little bit more as well. Um, it's a year over year type of thing. So it's typically a, and I say year over year, um, most of the cost benefit is a reserved instance for a two, maybe three year type of approach. Um, not so much just a one year, but um, you're going to get a bigger cost saving if you, you know, opt in for a, like a three year approach on, a lot of these different services. So anything you'd like to add there? Yeah, you pretty much hit it um, right there that, you know, three years reserve is going to be potentially much better than buying it one year because Microsoft, obviously, if they increase the price in the year two and you already have reserve instances for three years, then you're good to go, right? And the other good thing about reserve instances is uh, you don't have to pay upfront. You can also choose the month to monthly cost as well. So you, if you're on a fixed budget, you're still paying a fixed fee, but you know, um, on a monthly basis, you don't have to pay lump sum. Sometimes Microsoft said, okay, you have to pay up lump sum. People are like, oh my God, that's going to be huge, right? Think from your aspect, right? If you have to pay a lump sum out for something, that's going to be huge. But if you break it down to a month to month basis, uh, fixed amount that actually makes it easier as well so uh reserve instance is huge i still see a lot of people not utilizing or taking care of or using reserve instances because um uh, but that's a great tool and with that being said the lot what's new so this slide might be a little bit older because i know microsoft keeps changing a lot of things generally speaking you know when we talk about reserve instances uh we're talking about virtual machines. We're talking about storage. Uh, Microsoft actually added databases now to reserve instances. So there are a lot of other things. And as you might be aware, right, cloud keeps changing. So even uh, by the time we, we record this session, there's going to be new things coming out already. Uh, so the whole idea of Azure reservations is, you know, you want to have a predictable budget and cost because, you know, as everything cost keeps going up. So Microsoft also has to keep, uh, increase the cost, but reserve instance, you pretty much said, yep, I'm gonna log this in for three years and I know what the three years are gonna look like for me. So Abdul, I, I'm glad you opened up the door for the, you know, as soon as we record this, you know, things change. So if you don't mind, I've got a, I've got a resource that I'd like to share with everybody. I'm just Absolutely. gonna bring this up. Um, inside of Microsoft Logs, um, there is a monthly publication that uh, at least the Microsoft cost management team goes through. They talk about all the features that have changed over the past month, um, you know, any kind of pricing information. We talked about tags, um, new features like tag inheritance using APIs. Um, cost management labs, so a bunch of preview stuff. So for anyone who hasn't looked into this, 
um, kind of a neat approach. Um, it allows you to preview a bunch of things that are, you know, coming or being worked on. Um, but again, you know, recommendations on how to save money, some learning opportunities, and all kind of documentation. So month over month, um, new publications out there, I find that resource to be huge um, and very helpful to folks. Hopefully you do as well. Um, but yeah, with that said, I think we're ready to wrap here. So we've had a blast putting this together. Um, I know it's still a little early. You know, we, we lost a, an hour overnight because of this time zone thing. Hopefully it's the last time we get to do this. Fingers <laughs> crossed. Here in the U.S. at least. And oh, I think that still affects you in Toronto too. But In Canada, um, correct. Yes. But yeah, this has been a blast. Hopefully you all found this to be, um, you know, very helpful. Um, we thank the, the folks at Organize Azure Spring Clean once again. Um, great job. It's great resources brought to the community. So we thank you for those efforts and the opportunity to do this. Um, Abdul, any parting words you'd like to add? No, thanks for uh, um, putting this together. Uh, this is our second time presenting. And uh, yeah, always great to be part of the community. We're always here. So if you have any questions or follow-up questions, reach out to us, uh, to Chris or myself. We'd be happy to answer any questions. Yep. With that being said, um, hopefully you enjoyed it. And then have a good night, good evening, and good day. All right. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>